So that's what I'm saying. The text is like an object. It's going to change perspective based on where you're standing. I don't know. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I missed you, baby sweet. It was a day. Hmm. It was a day. Please tell me you're seeing this too. From Seattle, we are drinking the movies. I'm Taylor Baker. And I'm Michael Clausen. All right, Michael, what if I told you the year was 2020 and we were talking about new releases? Uh, I would be excited. Those are few and far between these days. What if I told you you already watched them? Are you still excited? That means I am prepared to talk. That does. Kind of. But are you still excited to have watched these new releases? Oh, uh, two out of the three, I think. Two out of the three? Okay. You? Um, no, I could have taken one and that I was waiting for for a long time anyways and, and been good not seeing the others. We'll find out why. Yeah. What are we drinking today? You tell me. I forget what the name of this particular beer was. It's pretty hard to remember. It's the Northwest Pilsner. From Hellbent Brewing Company. Yep. Still delicious. It's a nice mid five point something percent. Just a... A delicious, cold, crispy beer on a very hot day. And because we're recording, the AC has to be off right now. It does. Poor it's a us. little warm, but we'll make it. And we'll start with first impressions, which are what today? We got The Devil All the Time, as well as I'm Thinking of Ending Things. Which would you like to watch first? Let's do The Devil All the Time. How and why people from two points on a map without even a straight line between them can be connected is at the heart of our story and knock them stiff. You ever think about how we ended up orphans living in the same house? I know what my daddy did. Some people would say it's just dumb luck. You take pictures? I do. I see a smile pretty enough to photograph, that is. Others would tell you it was God's plan. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That ain't no preacher. He's as bad as they got on the damn radio. When people look back on it, they had no other choice. There's a lot of no good sons of bitches out there. Excuse me, preacher. You got time for a sinner? studied something. It's called the delusion. A belief that is untrue. It is our delusion that lead us to sin. <laughs> Delusions! All right, we just watched the trailer for The Devil All the Time by Antonio Campos. What are you thinking? I forgot what it was like to be excited for a film, Michael. Looks like a real movie, huh? I am thrilled right now. Uh, Antonio Campos, I forgot, but he made Christine, starring Rebecca Hall, which is one of my top 20 films from the 2010s, easily. That is one of the the better, you know, walk and talk single performer pieces. I'd, I'd put it up there with Jackie. It's one of those great, performances of that decade from just a singular perspective under the skin equally you know in that vein an all-star cast also he directed martha marcy may marlene is is that the right way of pronouncing that i think that was sean durkin if i remember oh correctly. sean durkin okay mm -hmm. which I, I get those two mixed up to be honest but then then he must have produced that because because it's also um showing up on his filmography somewhere i am thrilled i am thrilled i am thrilled very rarely do i get underwhelmed by films that star or have both mia wazakowska wazakowska and robert pattinson that's always a good sign yeah the talent on here is is pretty striking um and i'm sure there are other movies that you could also say this about i don't know why i'm just particularly struck by 
the like particular generation of all of these cast members. Maybe like, because think, two of them are in two of our top favorite directorial debuts this year, being Eliza Scanlon and Haley Bennett. Very true. Yeah, up and comers. I think. I mean, I know Jason Clark is probably older. He looks like yeah, he's maybe in his forties or fifties. But like, these are mostly pretty young actors. Well, Pattinson's um, getting up there. Don't forget. Yeah, I don't know what I'm. I should not be trying to guess the ages of uh, the cast members, but it just feels like a a a, a uh, up and coming gen up and coming generation of actors that that's really cool to see uh, cast this kind of stacked. Um, don't have a great sense of the plot, and I am totally fine with that. Um, and I think there's a bad I, preacher in sex in the woods. Yeah, and there's some guns. Interpersonal conflict in like this southern backwoods town looks dope um if even though it wasn't sean durkin it seems to have that same kind of dread that martha marcy may marlene had um my understanding is that those two directors work together quite a bit um as you said because like they produce each other's films like i think i read if i understood this correctly they started a production company like at a film school with the director who made James White. Did you see that film? Oh, yeah. Where... I love that movie. Me too. Um, where they would each take turns directing whatever they wanted to make while the other two produced. Um, and I think Martha Marcy made Marlene was one of those. Um, so it's awesome that that like that worked. I just love the idea of like strong directors working on each other's projects. Like That's super cool. Um, and this looks dope. I am thrilled, Michael. I am thrilled. This film comes out on September seven or sixteenth on Netflix, so basically everyone with internet can watch it. Let's get on to our second first impression title of the day. I'm thinking of ending things by Charlie Kaufman. <laughs> Here they come. Oh, Jeff has told us so much about you. He's told me so much about both of you, too. And you came anyway. <laughs> Jake tells me you're studying quantum psychics. Mm, physics. Really? <laughs> but there's just something okay. profoundly wrong here. Are you okay? Yeah. I think you've ending so. I am so glad Jake has found someone. <laughs> Soon this will all be a distant memory. Who is this? It's me. No, it was me. I tell you, I would misplace my own head if it wasn't screwed onto my own head. I feel like I was seeing them as they were. Seeing them as they will be. Seeing them after they're gone. No, thank you, Ben. Can you stay here? Excuse me? You don't have to go. I don't have to go where? Forward. People like to think of themselves as points moving through time. But I think it's the opposite. We're stationary. And time passes through us. <laughs> blowing like cold wind. Maybe this is how it was always going to end. That was the trailer for Charlie Kaufman's I'm Thinking of Ending Things, which comes out on September 4th. This looks dope. Uh, I realized that I think I had kind of the wrong perspective of this movie from the very little I knew about it. Um, I knew that it starred Jesse Buckley and Jesse Plemons as a couple, so I kind of interpreted the title as like a breakup movie, which seemed oddly kind of like small or specific for a Charlie Kaufman movie. Now that I've actually seen the trailer and it seems much more kind of existential in its uh, use of the title. Um, that sounds much more like Charlie Kaufman. Um, I think it looks awesome. Um, kind of horror adjacent, but maybe more, you know, just kind of psychological horror territory. But with him, you know, you will always kind of expect some postmodern twist. Um, I think it looks great. What about you? 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, this looks like a different way of making me feel how Synecdoche made me feel. Um, it looks formally dazzlingly accomplished. Tony Collette looks amazing. I'm excited to continue to see uh, not Jesse Plemons, but Jesse Buckley. Is mm-hmm. that her name? Um grow and and flourish you know you and i saw her in a very small movie at the art house Mm. theater called or maybe we saw it at the amc downtown maybe that was the only place it was uh playing in the state but anyways the film was beast movie past days yeah yes that's right Mm. that was movie past days that was 2017 or something like that before we even started the podcast i think Mm -hmm. and just seeing that slow rise for her, watching Wild Rose last year, which was mm. such a great performance by her, into seeing something of this magnitude put on her shoulders with Jesse Plemons, who is as good of a person you could share that that load with. And then mm-hmm. having David Thewlis and Tony Cl- I mean, this is thrilling stuff. These are the best two movie trailers I think I've seen in tandem, possibly since theaters shut down. Yeah, you feel kind of greedy watching them, right? I, like, I feel not on, only space greedy, out by like months. but I feel giddy. Those are 10 days apart. Yeah. I am thrilled. I am dazzled. I am so excited, Michael. Good times ahead. <laughs> Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast. Providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space so you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. We recently joined as members, and you can too. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at P-O-D-G-O dot C-O. All right, let's um, really boil down this positivity. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna really dial it back now. And talk about Seth Rogen's An American Pickle. It's been 100 years. The pickle brine preserved him perfectly. Get too old to do that. The world has changed. Everyone I know is gone. We were able to track down a great grandson. Green Bob. Green Bob. <laughs> this is nuts. Walk past the cafe, but you don't need when you live to. The opponents, where are they? They passed away. It was a car crash. He will tell me everything of their deaths, how their bodies died, their faces as the life left. We will bond over our pain. Mm-hmm. Oh no, love, you're not alone. I understand why you're a religious person, but I am not. How do you grieve for dead parents? Doing okay. I have an idea. They start big old business. That's a very stupid idea, Herschel. You have no wife, no children, Dude. no friends, no job. You need help. I'm fine. You're not alone! You will become success. Wow. Ooh, very pungent. Mmm, yeah, that's straight from the devil. You will finally make their parents proud. Don't you talk about my parents. You never met them! You have captivated the hearts of the entire world. And probably not best case scenario for what the families become. In old country, we have say. I'm sure this has aged well. If man does not throw punch, it is because these men secretly had polio arm. Do something, Ben! Throw your punch! You know they cured polio, right? A guy named Jonas Salk. Was he Jew? He was this. Is this your father? No, that's David Bowie. Is this your mother? No, that's also David Bowie. That whole poster is David Bowie. All right, Michael. Seth Rogen's An American Pickle involves rainwater and salt. And Seth Rogen. Reusable jars. That yep. is a critical aspect of the business model. That is true. That That's how you get the uh, um, the press on your right. side. Streaming now on HBO Max. Mm-hmm. Starring Seth Rogen opposite Seth, Seth Rogen. Rogen. Yeah. With a brief appearance by Sarah Snook from Succession. She is great, but she's not worth watching this film. We are generally both negative on this film. Yeah, my rating really does not reflect my feelings verbally. My rating is two and a half. I think yours is about the same. Same thing. Um, 
I could bring it down to a half a star real easy, have no qualms about it. It's just not a good movie. It's a good sketch. It's a fun character. It's a it's a good like three minute story you tell about like some funny stuff, but just the the builds and the the plot points and the formulaicness of, of having to do these you know stupid things just to move the plot along and to to get the billboard down and then have that have had nothing to do with the actual finale like the climax of the film or the purpose of the inciting incident has nothing to do with the resolution Mm. and and in the end that's why this is a bad movie because the story Mm. doesn't even follow basic structure of how to tell a story which is to have the inciting incident essentially this has two he gets turned into a pickle Mm. the billboard is owned by cossacks Mm -hmm. those are the two inciting incidents and to have neither of those really get paid off in any significant way in its resolution and just go to like a family acceptance humdum humdrum stupid like falsified ethical forgiveness for things that don't make sense to forgive it's just it's entirely weak i completely agree we are on the same page on this one um i was optimistic about it i don't know i I did not expect so much of this to be predicated on a feud between the older rogan character and the younger character i don't know why i was i was hopeful that this would be more like guys against the world kind of more of like a hangout movie um that would probably have some uh, plenty of cliches which it does about the older rogan you know beating the fish out of water in the modern world uh it definitely has its cliches there about him just like but it's not even cliches it's just like political points yeah and just in kind of the you know hipster jokes about artisanal pickles and that kind of stuff you know well i mean that's um, one of them but then like the conference where he's talking where he like eggs him on into saying like what that religion thought at that point in time where he's from about something is just like if you're learning about the history of religion through seth rogan films don't learn <laughs> Mm. yeah i agree yeah i don't i don't i don't think there's anything to be learned from from this movie i definitely would not characterize it that way i had hoped that there would just be more like in meaningful or or kind of enjoyable dialogue between them instead of enthusiasm yeah it's it's very kind of limp in its storytelling and you're right it does feel like something's just been stretched beyond what it was really able to sustain i like can see you know what it's like it's like they're trying to use a twist tie like a rubber band that's what it's like like they can do the same thing but Mm. they're like you have to twist the twist tie you have Mm. to loop the rubber band i like that analogy yeah it does it, it does not gather much uh momentum which i would be okay with like i'm okay like i was kind of open to more of a hangout low-key kind of seth rogan movie but i don't think this really creates much of a bond that's all that interesting between either rogan character and i don't think the performances are on either side of this character are particularly interesting i think the younger version is really a pretty generic hipster archetype uh, which is like, I feel like I'm just stating the complete obvious as I say that, but I feel like it should still be said that there's just no personality to this character. Well, the, to build on that, what you're saying is the limits of how much you can say about his character, which is the problem with his character. You hit on it. There's nothing else to say about him. His parents died. The end. Yeah, I... And you had to spend how long watching this movie? And that's all you know about this guy? And it's not a very long movie, but it feels long. Oh, it's way too long. Like 90 minutes, I think? Yeah, well, the, it's 90 minutes in total. I think credits roll about 86, 84, mm-hmm. 86. I, I would say if this movie was not a movie and was like a hyphenated short at about 40 minutes, 
it could have been fun. You could have had all the funny beats with the pickle cart and the rainwater and the interns and everything mm-hmm. and just have it end with him taking the billboard sign down and then like, you know, so whatever sort of gratification you want to put between the two characters. Mm-hmm. But having the Canadian chase scene and not even involving Reno 911 or the uh, the Broken Lizard crew um, mm. was just, yeah. Yeah, I thought I would find the the older Mort Bomb endearing for a while. I was kind of intrigued by Rogan playing him as kind of this timid, shy guy in you know completely out of his element and and then as it wore on i just it started to feel more lazy to me like he just didn't know how to bring much more life to this character i really don't think this is very well performed by uh by him in either role uh and that's unfortunate because he's in every scene (laughs) i think he did a decent job of acting as if he was both characters I think that I would not express that it was good, but th- there is that thing of when you're playing two characters, um, especially if both characters are facing the camera at the same time, it's kind of hard to sell that stuff. And I think he does the very basic mechanics of it pretty pretty astutely. He's he's never been a performer that I think, you know who should be a dramatic actor? Mm-hmm. No. Steve Jobs is the one movie that Seth Rogen was good in as a dramatic actor. Can you name another one? Uh, Not at the top of my head, unfortunately. And that's because he played Laws, who got to be kind of angry directly at Fassbender, who Mm. kind of controlled everything. Or he was having to interact with Kate Winslet, who is Mm. a thunderstorm, a hurricane. You know, she's a force of nature that can make anything equal to her. Um, there's, There's very little good here and most of the good is just kitschy jokes um kitschy is a good word that would be like on a tumblr like you would just like be scrolling through a tumblr and you'd be like oh that's like a funny premise Mm -hmm. the end yeah uh and that's maybe the best way i could review this movie oh that's a funny premise the end you find yourself talking about the premise because there's not that much texture to it to it yeah yeah, i'm doing like a little bit of movie reinvention here which i don't think is always the best kind of movie talk but i do feel like this would have been better had the younger seth rogan actually been more like the typical stoner type that we usually see i think that would have been much more appropriate for this idea about family history and maybe wanting to to live up to your family legacy and not really managing to like he's trying to get this app off the ground but he still looks like he's doing fine like i don't know that there's really enough disparity between what oh dude he has the, a nice apartment it's a very York. bougie hip apartment like there's not enough of of a disparity between what the older more bomb wanted his kid to become and what he actually is like i think he should have been the stoner type and that would have been a hilarious clash did you notice also that he was friends with chris parnell you can't be poor and be friends with chris parnell who's chris parnell i'm bang uh he's the guy that he was going to for funding Oh, uh, he's from the Lonely Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah okay. I, I couldn't have told you his name, but oh, uh, I know that face yeah, from yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Pop Star for sure. Yes, or Hot Rod, or or, oh, yeah. or yeah. Not as many laughs as I was hoping for. Um, which uh, not not terribly insightful, but still worth throwing out there since it's a Seth Rogen movie. You're coming for that, I think. Uh, in part, at least. I don't know. Any other thoughts? I think if you're doing chores while this movie is on, that would be the optimal way to watch it. So that it's just like something that you know about, but you didn't have to like put everything down to watch it. If you just watch it, I feel bad because that's what I did. And it was bad. Um, Do you have a favorite scene? Uh, I will speak very generally instead about something i like which is just kind of about the look of the movie i do feel like 
uh, with a lot of direct to streaming films these days, more and more of them just look kind of visually flat and like television. I do like that this tried to have some visual personality, especially in the first half when we're in the old country. Um, mm-hmm. There's, you know, just something different going on with the lensing that's kind of like a fisheye. It's not really a fisheye, but um, I appreciate the, the willingness to yeah, try kind of a period, something. A forced period feel. Yeah. I mean, it is not Optic. particularly um, beautiful, but I, I appreciate the willingness to, you know, do something that feels a little cinematic. So that is a very general <laughs> compliment rather than a particular scene, which I thought was much harder. What about you? The top of the credits. Oh, okay. On to She Dies Tomorrow. I am going to die tomorrow. Amy! What is going on? There is no tomorrow for me. All right, listen, Amy, I'm really freaking out right now. I feel like you put this idea of dying in my head. Can can you just call me back? You expecting someone? Hello, Jane. You okay? I just have this feeling I'm going to die tomorrow. But how do you know? I just know. Okay, so you don't know. Happy birthday to you. She Dies Tomorrow, uh, starring Kate Lynn Scheel, Jane Addams. There's a few other people in there, like Chris Messina and Katie Asselton, but really it's Jane Addams and Kate Lynn Scheel's uh, kind of show, in mm-hmm. my perspective at least. Um, yeah, what you, would you think in general about this one, Michael? I'll just quickly say, you, you mentioned Christmas scene. I, I immediately found myself trying to remember when we ranked our favorite Chris's where I had put Christmas Cena and really hoping I had put him towards the top because I was like, I really like this guy, but I couldn't remember. If I uh, remember, he's in the top three for both of he's us. He's good. I like him. Because we put Chris Pratt at four. I'm not a, not a big Chris Pratt or No, fan. no, no. I put him at five and I put O'Dowd at four, I think. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about Chris O'Dowd. That's right. Yeah. Maybe you have to revisit that list at some point. I think I had Chris Evans too high. I think Chris Pine mm. does deserve to be higher than Chris Evans upon rethinking this. But yeah, mm. Chris Messina, definitely a top three Chris. Word. Uh, but you're right. Bit, he's uh, more of a minor character here. Caitlin Sheel and Jane Adams are largely carrying this. I really like this movie. I know we split on this one a bit. We do. Um... Yeah, it's uh, kind of a low-budget indie psychological horror film um, about a woman uh, played by Caitlin Scheel who has the conviction for unknown reasons that she will die the following day. Um, and that Did belief... you watch the movie? I did. She knows why she thinks she's going to die the next day. What did she say? You watching the movie find out that her boyfriend had the same thing. Well, right, but I just mean I'm I'm describing the initial preface. Oh, okay, of the movie. okay. Sure. I thought you were saying in like totality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, you eventually find out she received this idea from from, from the boyfriend. pizza. You think it originated with the pizza itself? Oh, death is pizza. Oh, that is not good for that restaurant. That's all. I mean, if death is just in general pizza, we're all going to die tonight. I love pizza so much. Me too. It's bad. Uh, Yeah, it's about this idea that um, you are going to die tomorrow, spreading amongst a small cast of characters, but kind of originating with Caitlin Scheel, going from her to Jane Addams. Um, Yeah, I dug it. I thought... uh, the, the mood and atmosphere was was, was super well directed. Um, I think this has interesting ideas on its mind about people confronting their mortality and how people respond to it in different ways. And I like that the plot is just kind of um, written an, well enough to get us to where we need to go thematically, but um, not overly written. I dug it. You not so much, I gather. Not so much. Uh, you saying, like, not written too much. I say not written enough. Like, um, I really do think that she's an interesting director. 
And I really like her quote unquote what is called experimental film, but has now been in circulation for over well over 50 years. So we really shouldn't be calling it experimental film anymore. But the close up microscopic, mm. you know, images, the, the acidity, the, you know, the, the cool LSD trippy visuals are awesome and they'd be fine in any other story this is just a very dull way of getting me to watch a movie about death in Mm. general like i'd I'd rather watch any one of these characters just go through the entire spiral down um Mm. so that i could maybe get a little bit more inertia or momentum into the character that i'm following but it's a little bit scattered all over the place. It's kind of got that Joe Swanson vibe of, of being an indie, you know, sprawling thing rather than something narrow and mm-hmm. focused. And when I watch a, or sorry, Swanberg, I think I said Swanson. Mm-hmm. Um, when I watch an indie movie I that, that gets sprawling, I, I tend to never really enjoy it because mm-hmm. it loses its own scope or momentum of the catalyst that that kind of created the project and Mm. i think that watching you know like if we followed um jane adams into kate asselton and chris messina's home and then just watched everything that happened there Mm. that would have been great because asselton is super engaging as a performer when she's given a lot of leash she's Mm. really really fun and and really engaging and messina is equally competent a performer Mm. and can do whatever you want him to um but the fact that they're just kind of introduced and then we're we're going and watching that other couple um pull the plug on his dad like i just never felt um like i was personalized into feeling this movie Mm. i never felt attached to it and at some Mm. level of experience with art you have to feel engaged by it or with Mm. it and I just felt like I was looking at something that I didn't feel engaged with the whole mm-hmm. time. And that doesn't mean that I think that she shouldn't make projects or that I'm not interested in the next one. It's just I found it very dull. And I would equally be as interested in watching her make, you know, kind of more of a formulaic comedy or an indie comedy. Because I think that she's got a real penchant for creating character. But I, I mm-hmm. don't find, you know... Uh, Jane Adams deciding to cut her wrist and then walking through mm-hmm. Michelle Rodriguez and Olivia Taylor Dudley's living room to be mm. interesting at all. Mm. I just don't. It's fair. I, I, I you, you described it as scattered. I, I could totally understand that response. What I, I like about getting to look at a bunch of different characters as they undergo this is getting to see the different ways in which people respond to something that I think a lot of people, or at least some people go through at some point in their lives, which is uh, seriously reflecting on the fact that we are not here forever and the, the different ways people respond to that, whether that's with sheer kind of nonchalance and resignation. I think that's what I got from watching Michelle Rodriguez, which is, almost more like a kind of shrug to what is happening. Other people respond um, with hostility, which is how Chris Messina and his wife in particular respond. Um, Keelan Shiel is just, you know, in utter despair over it. Um, And I think for me, by exploring this feeling over a group of characters, it is not only personal in the sense that I think Caitlin Scheel is kind of our anchor for this. It it helps to suggest more of a kind of collective mood um, that will make it a really interesting artifact a long time from now. I mean, even though this was made, you know, however long ago, we remember movies in the era in which they were released, and that is the era of covid Um, and I think the idea that each of these people are receiving these deeply negative, upsetting thoughts and forced to confront them on their own, um, 
is uh, a cool idea that I think she's putting to the screen with really well cultivated moods and uh, visual style. Um, it, yeah. Uh, does that make sense? I understand how you viewed it. Yes. Fair enough. I personally just disagree on like the premise of death to begin with. Like hmm. presenting death is something that is only essentially until we get to Michelle Rodriguez and Olivia Taylor Dudley perceived as a negative, I think is very hmm. weak and just hmm. in the entire premise. Like I, I, you know, anecdotally I've gone through my own life experiences where I've been in situations um, that I've had to confront this and it just feels like a very low resolution, very unpersonal interaction with interrogating the meaning of life which is brought on by death or what to do in the mm. face of death while you still have life it just mm. does not interrogate those ideas in any way that is interesting or fascinating um it does have some moments of like honesty that we see with uh caitlin shield specifically when she wants to to go do the thing that she um went with her boyfriend to and he had the plans to go do, she wanted to go do that stuff. Like I, I did find that part of the plot a little bit engaging, but it's not a very thoughtful piece on what the philosophical topic is that it's purporting to be about. Uh, well, I mean, I guess I don't know that I would describe it as philosophical. I think that's fair. I think I would describe it as, uh, an illustration of the emotional responses people have to the epiphany or the sudden thinking about our own mortality. And I think I think it's personal in how it details Caitlin Shields' experience, which we ultimately gather was a breakup after the boyfriend seemed to have has had gone through his own crisis and she winds up alone in a new house. And I think I like that that's just enough for me to imagine the the position she's in of trying to start over again, reckoning with um, what, she, what, what she has accomplished, what, what relationships have not worked out, and trying to think about um, what, what makes things w- worth living anymore. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I think I appreciate the space this gives me to think about what these characters are experiencing versus plot that is um, providing closure that gives, that gives me more, reason, more reasons to forget about it. Yeah, I, I think this is a film that I wouldn't push towards desiring more plot from, but rather more character. I I don't think that, that Caitlin uh, actually is as developed as she could have been. I think there's a great start there, but I I don't feel that she was given um, enough moments within the film to interact via dialogue with additional characters Mm. in order to really express the emotional range of this character. Mm. And I don't think that's due to her lack of ability. I think that's just by the nature of either how it was edited or um, the way it was written. There's there seems to be a deep well of um, personal feeling that she has in the character that she's performing that we didn't get to engage with that I think by engaging with an audience member like me would have been maybe more um, found more personalization to the narrative being presented. But there wasn't really a level of um, personalization there for me to, to map onto. So I just, kind of sat there going okay it's not a movie that i'm really viscerally against i just don't understand why it's so loved um but that's that's just i guess a a preference thing more than anything yeah well now now that i have at least tried to express the extent to which i did enjoy it i will completely agree with you there and i think that's a big part of the reason why i'm not as high on this as uh it maybe sounds like I I was given how I've talked about it up to this point. Um, like I don't think this is going to be my top ten or anything like that at the end of the year. Um, 
And I think you're right. There is something about um, what this movie loses by forcing these people to explore it kind of alone. I found myself thinking the exact same thing, that there would be um, potentially more kind of texture to these relationships if they did discuss what this feeling was like. Um, Because I think that's what we do do sometimes. Um, Yeah, I'm completely on board with that. That might have just provided a little more depth and color to these characters had they been forced to engage with each other in some way related to it. Well, even if they didn't engage directly upon the topic of knowing they are going to die, Mm -hmm. if a character that already knew they were going to die engaged in discussion with more characters, Mm -hmm. that would have been more interesting to me to see the world come to life. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we just watched it Palm Springs, right? Palm Springs Mm -hmm. is great because you're watching all this interpersonal dialogue and not all of it has something to do with the plot necessarily, or but it does give the character, each character, an amount to breathe. And yeah, it does reveal certain things, uh, but in general, it's just kind of allowing you to see more color of the character. Mm-hmm. And I think that that would equally be beneficial here if one of the characters had a significant more amount of dialogue time. I don't care which mm-hmm. one, but if one of them could have. Mm. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, there would be something to be gained from that. I mean, I think the, the the mood is what it is in part because I think there isn't that much dialogue, and that is partly what really attracts me to it. So that is tough. And I'm on the other side where I just was very disaffected by the mood. Fair enough. Um, yeah, Palm Springs is an interesting comparison because that is another film that I think has been talked about as uh, a timely viewing in this uh day and age because one day is hard to differentiate from the next in the era of covid um yeah you know these could potentially be interesting artifacts i think of their um of the era in which they were released um in that sense Um, this is feels more like the nihilistic counterpart to palm springs which is much more bubbly and it's yeah outlook i think i life. lean more towards palm springs being expressive i haven't watched host yet but based mm. on my understanding of it i think i'd probably say that host is going to be a little bit more uh emblematic of this time i i think that mm. my personal relationship with this film will not allow me to say that it seems like it's significant in any sort of a time stampy way unfortunately I, 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 I'll push back a little bit there in that I feel like Palm Springs feels so much more like television to me than this does, where this does feel distinctly cinematic in its use of the form. Um, but this Palm is maybe Springs taste. feels like television. In, in its... Uh, in its look, 100%. I, I definitely think that that has that, that kind of visual flatness that I associate. Oh, you mean like network television or something like that? Yeah. Okay, or, okay. Yeah. Um, and this feels more cinematically florid to you? M- more grounded in in mood, you know, than something that is cl- that could clearly be spun into, you know, a, a whole series of something. Um, yeah, I, I think this is... This just is immediately what I would more associate with the word cinematic than something like Palm Springs. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I guess I still think that it doesn't look that great and the stuff that looks really great, you could throw in any other movie because I I really just liked the trippy LSD stuff specifically Mm. or the artwork. Um, I didn't really care for the, you know, the coherence-esque look of the party Mm. when when she walks in and kind of that that nighttime thing like it didn't look that great to me um most of the sequences looked fine i don't think she's a bad director but i don't think that what i'm seeing here is anything that i would like say is emblematic of the content or qualities of cinema over something else Mm. like a a goat walking into a time hole (laughs) fair um (laughs) This is maybe a stretch. A movie that popped into my mind when I was thinking about She Dies Tomorrow was The Dead Don't Die. Um, 
just in the sense that that has some indie credibility to it in its casting. And that's another film that I think is exploring kind of a cultural mood by way of genre. In that one, it's the zombie movie. And this is like the disaster movie in a way. That's a, that, that's what this feels like to me is, is that something is afflicting the population. Um, and that is like despair in a way. Um uh, I don't know. I think there's something kind of interesting about uh, filmmakers using using genre to um, ex- explore whatever sort of um, feeling is kind of permeating the zeitgeist. That film was obviously much more uh, political in all of its references, but I think there will be something interesting when we look back on these films about the the feelings they capture and associated with their eras. Yeah, I think this is a title that you would put in with a bunch of other titles. It's not the title you would point at. Mm. It would be the only point that I... Like, to me, The Dead Don't Die is the title that I would point at. And She Dies Tomorrow is a, is a title that would be in with a group of titles that we would be mm. discussing. It wouldn't be, like, the thing that is emblematic of the culture by itself to me. It's it's not one of those mm. films. Mm. Yeah. I'll point to it. I'll say, go watch it. Go ahead. I will disagree. (laughs) All right. Shall we move on? Favorite scene? I, I I mean, I enjoyed all of the, you know, kind of formal flourishes when, you know, the screen's kind of filling up with this, with this imagery of of the bacteria and strobing lights and all that. But I, I thought Jane Addams was hilarious. I really liked the finish where this is super specific, but she's just like flailing around on that, like, floaty in the pool mm-hmm. getting up on Flares. it you mean loved it yeah i'll go with that what about you um i'll pick kind of a still image again um of when the they're panning away from the conversation happening in the living room i believe or may, maybe everyone's like gotten up and gone and you're just kind of looking straight on at a wall with a mm. painting that is like a classical mm. painting that has the same paint as the walls over it on the top and the bottom and then circles on top of all the faces of the subjects. I just mm-hmm. thought that was a really cool striking image. There was. Uh yeah, I found myself uh looking at that image and ignoring dialogue temporarily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um on to Waiting for the Barbarians from Chio Guerra. Are you familiar with these parts of the frontier? Not with this part. Not yet. There is an episode of hysteria about the barbarians. I have orders to obey. I am speaking of particular situations. Situations where I am probing for the truth. Since all is not well here, I expect further measures will be taken. Controls are conducting operations to correct the situation that you've allowed to develop. What did they do to you? Do you want me to take you back to your family? The barbarians whom you are chasing. This is their land, they know every inch of it, you do not. Did you really say that there will be a great war against the Empire? Pain is truth. That is how you get it. You have no idea how tiresome your behavior is. You are an obscene torture! We have set procedures. We're ready to go. You've been treasonously consulting with the enemy. Get out! I want these people out of here! We will end these troubles. We will put down the enemy. And that will be the end of it. All right, Michael. This is a film starring Mark Rylance with supporting roles by Johnny Depp and Robert Pattinson. What did you think about this one? I was a little bit cooler on this movie than I think you were. Um, uh, Where to begin? We talked about... Uh, whereas last film on the podcast a long time ago, Birds of Passage, which I think we were both he positive on. 
co-directed. Um, I think this might be the first one from him that I've seen from him. Mm. Just just him, rather. Mm. Well, I felt like this was maybe um, a direction that I was not terribly excited to see him go in, but I think there's some interesting things about this movie. Um, I guess I felt like Birds of Passage was really cool for how sort of culturally specific and completely lived in some of the acting was. And this feels like a step towards the Hollywoodish for me. Mm-hmm. Um, a little closer to kind of the, the more typical oscar prestige kind of movie. Um, Do you think it feels like a modern prestige oscar movie, though? Potentially in its oh, okay. use of ambiguity. Um, you know, th- like there's never any specific mention of the location. I think that's very important to like the conceit of this movie, right? That we're spending most of this movie in this kind of desert landscape. That's this outpost on a border. I think it feels like South America, but we never really specify a country or something like that. Nor do we really specify the culture that these um, British guys are calling barbarians so i think there is this right this very intentional well, that's, I, I mean so we already disagree mm. i think very clearly the empire is a british empire i would agree that they are british for and sure and that they are on the border of where the arab nations meet the steppes of asia oh. Oh, okay and that the the nomadic people who are called barbarians are mm. the the Asians that live on the steppes mm. that are horseback riders, which are, you know, pretty well storied warriors going back to Genghis Khan. Totally fair. That is then completely on me. I just don't think there's any mentioning in this script. There is. Of where it they doesn't are. define exactly where they are, but I mean, they have to go up mountains to meet mm. Asians on horseback, which is exactly sure. the nomadic peoples of the steppes. And they are in a desert. Mm. So geographically, you have to assume you're in an Arab mm. border nation against the, the steppes, which mm. is, I mean, the steppes are huge. So that Fair that's enough. maybe why you don't need to be super specific about it. Fair enough. I assumed he was deliberately withholding some of those specific details for the sake of sort of metaphorical flexibility um i think it was but, just not to not to get too wound up in your definitions and just let the story be fair enough um what did you like about it i mean just building on that like to, to me it's it is not but it is in the vein of a, a david lean kind of epic where mm. you know it's about an empire but it's also about a man standing for what he thinks is right which is fixing the problems of the brutality of his empire which seems like a very poignant topic today Mm -hmm. um and just full transparency mark rylance has been one of my favorite performers since about 2014 probably um 2018 Mm -hmm. I think I watched Wolf Hall in its entirety and he Hmm. just kind of jumped into my pantheon of top 10, top five favorite living actors. I'm always going to show up for his performances. Bridge of Spies kind of revealed him to me and I've just been Hmm. engrossed by him ever since. I think his motion capture work in um, Ready Player One is actually quite remarkable despite your feelings on the film. Um, And I found myself drawn towards the body the bodily acting that he performs here um and and how convicted he was and how kind of aloof but also caring his character Mm. is i see both sides of not liking johnny depp's character i personally loved Mm. it but it that's you know neither here or there i i do think that the central performance of this film is the purpose of the film and i think that it's executed perfectly yeah I, i don't know i think part of what makes this feel like the kind of Oscar bait that I'm not so crazy about is in it's kind of moralizing. It's about, you know, his character being the do-gooder, the very compassionate, righteous soul objecting to what he sees as uh, wrong. And we're mostly there to 
to kind of sympathize with him and nod in agreement. I don't know that I find that much complexity in the situation, I guess. Um, so it's not terribly complex, but I will caveat what you're saying with the actual fact of the movie, which is that the woman he was caring for was upset by him and he mm-hmm. was totally unaware of it. Mm-hmm. So he was just as culpable in the things that he's against as she was, which I think bring, brings a much larger layer of of dynamism of, of you know, philosophical thought. I do. I don't think for me, that relationship just did not work. And I, I, I think it has to do with just the, the difference in, in performance between Rylance and that particular actress that just feel like they're operating on completely different planes where he feels like he is on the stage and he, and she does not. Um, and I think, I don't know. It, it, it left me a little bothered by how, little we get of that perspective um that that made me a little uncomfortable i don't know how well i can articulate why that is um so this is a novel adaptation you did not particularly like oh i actually didn't know that was an adaptation okay Hmm. um so my my understanding is that she's never really given a name she's just called the girl and Mm. mark rylance is kind of just the magistrate he is given a name within the film but his real you know, thing is just an archetype. Yeah. And I think that this story and this film are not about the particulars, but are about mm. the generalizations that are true um, about mm. someone who thinks they're doing the right thing, not doing the right thing, but simultaneously mm. being better than the wrong thing mm. and being in a place where the wrong thing is happening and you're in a situation to make it better. And you think that you're, good but you're just contextually good and that maybe without you they'd be fine yeah i mean uh uh i i agree i mean you're talking you're saying this not about the particulars i completely agree that's why i think it it is relevant that he doesn't bring the, the specifics to the script um but yeah i don't know how he explores rylance's character's revelation or or maybe you know just slowly starting to understand or at least think about in the end his com- complicity in this system um and there's is, there's is, is, it, it's it, of, of his complicity right mm, when he's mm. sitting there drinking his his whatever he's drinking tallying mm. up the the fruit pickers work mm. and clearly not working as hard as them but having mm. all the bounty like there's mm. There's some, I think, visual examples of the irony or or the criticism of these themes directly in the film that makes it a little bit more interesting than um, I, I think it's being contended with. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I think I think there is stuff there. I, I'm not sure it's helped by the theatricality of the mode of performances. Um how dare you? Mark Ryan I mean, is a saint. But I mean, just <laughs> but don't you feel like this is until that point where the movie decides to to acknowledge that Rylance's character is complicit in some way, is sort of enmeshed in this problematic situation. That is a, a, a huge understatement. That there is a pretty black and white kind of moral distinction between his character and Johnny Depp's character. Um that were just sitting through as we watch Depp be bad. Well, I think that's the thing that that is really interesting about telling a story is the way that humans want to make things black and white. And you'd already seen examples of him being a lazy magistrate and going and calling on a prostitute with with no, Mm -hmm. you know, guilt or, or no real social consequence for any of his behavior or any responsibility other than having, you know, his own interests constantly like his own fascination, his own interests in their culture, um, which is exemplified through these archeological digs and, Mm. and um, pieces of, of artifact writing that he's getting. Um, I, I think that up until that point, you don't realize that there's anything bad to what he's doing. But you've already seen examples of where he's not 
you know, colloquially in that village or or outpost, pulling equal weight to mm-hmm. every one of the subjects around him. Mm-hmm. And I think that a human's ability to watch a story like that and then decide what they'd already been seeing is it is now different just because of the different light that's being shown is what's interesting about storytelling in general and what's interesting about humans and how we map things. But I think that the the distinction of him being complicit was already there. You and I just hadn't been clued into it by the mm. narrative of the piece yet. Then maybe... I mean, I, that, that is what I, what I like about this movie and why like I'm not as negative on it as I think a, a lot of people have been i guess it's that it does wait quite a while to kind of acknowledge that which well it, it waits a while to let you know that but it's, right, but we it's been that. showing you that and stuff the whole time yeah i mean i think it really foregrounds the villainy the barbarism of of word? the empire of Johnny Depp and Robert Pattinson, right? Well, but um, but I mean, outside of them, is the soldiers and the the people making the decision to to send them in in the first place. the The Empire is the the barbers themselves, you, you know. And that's you know, I had this thought of how of what I could write the review, like maybe one eighth of the way into the film, and I I didn't write it in my review, but it's um, we were waiting for the barbarians the whole time, but they were there with us. Exactly. But doesn't that feel a little on the nose? I think that's the idea. That's what um, feels a little... Well, that, that is the theme. And whether or not that's on the nose or not is, to me, beside the point. If you don't like the theme, fine. You don't like the theme. That is the theme. And I think that it's a a eternal theme in storytelling. And maybe you didn't like it here. And you'll like it somewhere else where there's a, a much more you know, defined back structure, but like you didn't mind with She Dies Tomorrow. I don't Mm. mind um, letting this film be simultaneously simplistic while talking about, you know, themes that are um, kind of eternal themes that we'll continually as a species deal with. Yeah, I think it's for me partly about how the person, like how the, the Empire's evil is personified through really specific individuals that take uh the foreground for so much of the movie johnny depp and then later robert pattinson i mean those are really specific instances of someone who is so clearly terrible and soulless um that is not as i don't know i just don't get that much out of watching um that evil being carried out i don't know that that really I don't think we really spent that much time in the film watching the evil get carried out in the first half. You know, like Johnny Depp is there and then what he's doing is off screen. And then we're grappling with the consequences. But he's not like in on the screen for, you know, maybe 15 minutes Mm. of screen time total. I I just don't think it was that big of a deal. Right. But I mean, don't you think this makes a very strong point of emphasizing in a scene like where he talks about his methods of torture, of underlining and You mean bolding, his methods of getting the truth? Correct. Underlining and bolding his villainy. And, and it's partly a performance issue for me. Mm. Um, and that I think there's so, I feel a lot of effort being put into that understated mode of villainy. Um, but I think this goes out of its way to um portray the 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 villainy the, the the barbarism of of them rather than really exploring uh Rylance's complicity beyond him thinking he's good and maybe not be not being so yeah i think the story is is told kind of third person over the shoulder from his perspective and we're not really getting in with his own engagement with himself um, I can only propose my suppositions, which are, um, you know, after um, the woman who said that she would marry him, um, who, who's kind of an older woman in the village um, whose family's been sent away or she's sent them away, um, tells him that she had a personal relationship with the girl 
and the girl used to cry because Mark Rylance made her so upset. And him kind of take the, the way that he took that in and visually processed it is very theatrical, but I think it does communicate the point, um, which is that he understands that he did, but he does not understand why, because he does not understand how he is part of the problem. Mm-hmm. And I think that that in and of itself is n- is fine that's that's a good story that is something true that is something sincere that's something that happened before now that's something that's happening now that's going to happen in the future that's an eternal theme presented in a character that doesn't have super rigid restrictions but is a a pretty full-bodied character in performance and in in writing i have no problem with the narrative doing that or with a film telling that story when it is sincere and acted with the quality that the Rylance brings. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I, uh, I won't build on that. I, 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 I totally get it. Um, and, uh, I'll say that I am a little surprised by, by just how kind of mixed the response has been, because I do think it is like a very handsomely crafted movie. I think it's a, a very s- sturdy uh, period piece like this is often very uh gorgeous especially in some of the like the mid uh middle of the film subplot where we actually leave the outpost yeah the um, desert. So that's v- very very nicely crafted um that actually got me really far i was remember scrolling through letterboxd in the scene um you know some negativity about the pace of the film i actually loved that it was pretty slow like or oh, not yeah. slow, but that it, that it was not hurried, right? Like this is just about kind of being with these people in the outpost. With yeah, the it, it was living with them as events happen. Yeah, I was totally on board with that. Like I think there is um, something to be said for the craft that that is there for sure. The um, the sandstorms, I was very worried about. You know, when they're in the very mm. far background, the CG doesn't look great. Mm. But the closer and closer they get, the more it looks good. I agree. I couldn't That's cool. believe that they pulled it off. I thought it was going to be terrible. The amount of big budget movies, Bad Brothers or uh, Bad Boys, whatever the hell that was called, that had like a two hundred million something dollar budget and the worst fire I've seen all year. I couldn't believe they pulled off something way more complicated than fire, which is a sandstorm on a large scale in a movie that must be modestly budgeted. I don't know what the mm-hmm. budget of this movie is, but um, it's got a 53. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure that that means that it's going to qualify for our wounded oh, soldiers. Yeah. I think that I, I might have my my wounded soldier riding into the end of the year here. Um, just kind of anecdotally move through a few things. I don't know about you. This doesn't have a, a large score. But the moments that the score comes in, I was swept mm. away. This is by far one of my favorite orchestrals um, that, that I've heard all year. Um, there's a, a three main plot beats where these different orchestrals come in, and I just absolutely loved those scores. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would completely second those. Um I think a lot of the interiors look really nice. Some of these feel like they're naturally lit by candlelight. Some of that looks great. Um, I do really appreciate the uh, the attention to um, that kind of detail. Yeah, the the setting as well um, is kind of perfect. It, it kind of reminds me of um, El Topo, where you're just kind mm-hmm. of in this meta town. Um, or area, or even Holy Mountain, right? Where you're just in this meta-textual place that is all these different things. Um, I found myself thinking of, um, gosh, what's the 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 wind will carry us? Is that what it's called? The Kirstami one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I found myself kind of thinking of mm. that village and, and just the, the architecture of the desert and how 
this place could be in in so many i'm not very familiar with middle eastern um geography but it could just Mm. be in so many of those places that i've seen in different films and that it, it is a real place so far as i can tell um and the significance of the city over time it doesn't quite get to the wind will carry us um and you know the importance of of different structures but like the importance of the tree um mm. when he's hung from it after he's been beaten mm. versus when the the boys are playing tag and they run up to the tree having fun i i just really liked seeing one place come to life in different ways and the dichotomy of the negativity to the positive Let's leave it at that all right until next time run go get to the chopper we have to go i'm coming with you that was brilliant you're the best and we love you that's another one in the can